morning. I'm Anita Huberman. I'm CEO of the Surrey Board of Trade, and I'm also an honorary captain of the Royal Canadian Navy. Thank you so much for joining Surrey's city building business organization where we support business and bring business into the city. We are here for the first time going to hear from the new president of Simon Fraser University. She is simply amazing and innovative, and we're going to introduce her very shortly. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of our Coast Salish people, specifically the Kwatlen, Katsi, Semiamu, and Tawasin First Nations. Events like this simply would not take place without sponsorship at the Surrey Board of Trade. Thank you so much to our presenting sponsor, who you will hear from shortly, Central City and Blackwood Partners. Our community partners this morning are the Downtown Surrey Business Improvement Association, the Health and Technology District at the Lark Group, and the Surrey City Development Corporation. Our media partner for this event is the Surrey Now Leader newspaper. And of course, our business and international trade center sponsors located right here at the Surrey Board of Trade is the law firm of Faskin, the Business Development Bank of Canada, also known as BDC, and the Chambers of Commerce Group Insurance Plan, represented by SNF Benefits. Thank you so much for your support to the Surrey Board of Trade. I'd also like to recognize on the call today on this Zoom technology, our City of Surrey Councillor, Linda Annis, and the Consul General of Ireland, Frank Flood. Thank you both for joining us. Some instructions before we begin, all attendees are muted. If you do have a question, please put it in the chat function of the technology and we will get to your question right after the keynote presentation. And I wanted to ensure also that if you want to talk to each other, to network, to connect, that you're also utilizing the chat function. It's so important, even during the pandemic, to connect with one another and to grow your connections, but also to say hi uh, to those that are on the call that you may know are attending this morning. We have one hour with you, and we're so thankful that you've decided to spend this time with us. I first of all wanted to let you know that the Surrey Board of Trade, we just released the only COVID-19 playbook for business in partnership with the BC government and the Canadian government. It's on our website at businessinsurrey.com. It's a foundational document full of resources updated regularly with our government partners to ensure that not only during this crisis, but crises that are forthcoming, that you have the tools that you need. We have the only rapid response business center for the pandemic in British Columbia. We are your concierge of connections, instigating change at the different levels of government, and also we still have, as, as I mentioned, our business and international trade center, creating those global business connections for local businesses, because we need all of that to ensure economic recovery, not only for Surrey, which is going to be the largest city in British Columbia, but for British Columbia and for all of Canada. Now, I just wanted to mention that um, higher education and I'm a graduate of uh, Simon Fraser University, class of 1996. Uh, it's been a significant foundation of economic development. Uh, education and transportation is the foundation uh, of our city. And then everything else flows from that. Certainly the Surrey Board of Trade's action plan is premised upon that philosophy. Higher education has successfully supported growth economic development, and social change. While the industry has never faced the magnitude of change and disruption that it has during the pandemic, the challenges also come with tremendous opportunity, ladies and gentlemen. And their leaders and the leader that you're going to hear from shortly are finding new ways to deliver more value to students and to our workforce. 
We need to capitalize on new technologies, collaborate with industry to build a new model with education in partnership with government to create a supportive ecosystem for entrepreneurs, for our workforce, and for residents. We need a new way of shaping, working, and learning. It really is time to reinvigorate our higher learning system to ensure that we are the economy of today and tomorrow and to make sure that Surrey is an opportunity city. And there is uh, no other person that I know of that understands how Surrey is an opportunity city than our presenting sponsor representative. Please help me welcome Mr. Bill Rempel of Central City and Blackwood Partners to say a few words and introduce our keynote speaker. Bill, over to you. Thank you very much, Anita, and thank you for those kind words and for the opportunity today to be today's presenting sponsor. And good morning, everyone. I am Bill Rempel, Vice President of Blackwood Partners at Central City. 2020 began with something none of us faced before, the COVID-19 pandemic, and subsequently, a new way of life for all of us. Our new normal is one of striking a balance between being prepared, productive, safe, understanding, and flexible. As we move forward and navigate these turbulent times together, our primary focus at Central City has been to continue to support all of our tenants, staff, guests, and community partners, including the Surrey Board of Trade, Downtown Surrey BIA, and of course, Simon Fraser University. I would like to take this opportunity to give a big shout out to Fraser Health Authority. They are by far our largest tenant in the office tower. And I know Dr. Lee and her entire team has been to committed to keeping us safe. In case you are not aware, they recently opened a COVID testing site in the former Best Buy building at King George and Old Jail. Speaking of shout outs, I'd also like to give a big shout out to the entire team at Blackwood Partners, who has done an amazing job of keeping Central City moving forward during this difficult period. Simon Fraser and Central City have enjoyed a strong relationship since 2004, and I am personally very proud of what we have accomplished together for the city of Surrey. Central City has been at the epicenter of the revitalization of downtown Surrey, and together with SFU, we have really made a difference in building our new downtown core. Prior to COVID, people came from all over the globe to tour the site to see how a shopping center class A office space and a world-class university work and coexist to improve their community. This evolution will continue and we remain committed to working with all stakeholders. On that note, I am very pleased to introduce Joy Johnson. Prior to her appointment as president, Joy served as SFU's vice president research and international from 2014 to 2020, where she oversaw the evolution of cutting edge research, innovation, and international engagement across eight faculties. She is certainly no stranger to the Surrey campus. Under her leadership, SFU's research income grew from 103 million in 2014 to 161 million in 2020 the fastest growth of any Canadian university. Other major accomplishments include the launch of a groundbreaking big data initiative, hosting one of Canada's largest supercomputers and establishing a university-wide innovation strategy. As president, Joy is committed to enhancing the student learning experience, working towards indigenous reconciliation and advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion across the university. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the new president and vice chancellor of SFU, Dr. Joy Johnson. 
Well, thank you very, very, thank you very, very much, Bill. It is an absolute pleasure uh, to be here today. Thank you for that kind introduction. And also thank you to Anita for creating opportunities for this community to stay connected. It's fantastic to see an SFU alumnus leading an organization that supports businesses so effectively. So let me begin by acknowledging that I am privileged to be speaking to you today from my home in Vancouver, British Columbia, located on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. As settlers on this land, I believe we all have a responsibility to address and repair relations between ourselves and the indigenous peoples whose lands we occupy. I also wanna say that supporting indigenous leaders and communities is one of my top priorities. And in the weeks to come, I'm gonna be reaching out to First Nation chiefs south of the Fraser to continue our dialogue and to share SFU's commitments uh, to their communities. Let me also thank today's sponsors and everyone for logging on. It's great to see so many people um, uh, logged on today. Although I wish we could be together in person, uh, it really is an honor um, to speak to you today. The Surrey Board of Trade reflects what's best about our province and its business community. And I know that as SFU's new president, um, it is important for you to know how much I value our relationship, uh, especially during these challenging times. Uh, COVID may have upended our lives, but it hasn't diminished our resolve. Indeed, it's only strengthened our shared commitment to each other. The spirit that's reflected in your work and your support uh, to local businesses with initiatives um, like the Workforce Reset and the Surrey Pandemic Response Business Center, the first of its kind of Canada, really um, uh, is amazing. And um, we should all be so proud of the work that, uh, that you're doing. This spirit is also reflected in our work at SFU um, as we strive to improve public health um, and support economic recovery. From mechatronic systems engineering professor Wusu Kim's newly designed 3D printed ventilators to Alyssa Antel's work in the School of Interactive Arts and Technology on tech solutions to enhance children's mental health. Our researchers and our faculty members are building on SFU's long-standing commitment to make life better in the community. Today, we're gonna to hear from two people who really exemplify the spirit of university community collaboration. Dr. Diane Gromelai is a distinguished professor in the School of Interactive Arts and Technology on our Surrey campus. She's currently working on new health technologies that are gonna allow us to streamline the delivery of COVID vaccinations. And Doug Tennant, well known to you as the chair of the Surrey Board of Trade is the CEO, CEO of Unity, a partnership of three community organizations dedicated to building more inclusive communities. Doug's work with people with disabilities has been instrumental in making SFU a more diverse and welcoming community. But before we speak to them, and because this is my first opportunity to address the Surrey Board of Trade as, as SFU's president, I wanna say a few words about why I am so excited to be taking on this new role. Over my whole career, I've always believed in the power of education to transform lives and communities. It's one of the reasons that I went into academia. That belief has guided my work as an educator, administrator, and researcher. It's also been at the core of SFU's mission and mandate from the very beginning. There is no better example of this than SFU Surrey. SFU Surrey belongs to you. It reflects this community's enormous diversity and its potential. From all walks of life coming together in the pursuit of knowledge and for the love of ideas. Young people from every background determined to realize their dreams. Faculty members committed to teaching and discovery an academic community in conversation with the community and the wider world. This is what makes SFU Surrey such an exciting and wonderful place. Like few other institutions of higher learning, SFU is woven into the fabric of, our, of communities. As president of SFU, it's really my intention to strengthen these bonds. I wanna make sure that our students are equipped with the skills and the talents that they need to flourish in their own lives and in the community and as citizens. 
We will build a university culture that models our commitments to equity, diversity, and inclusion so that everyone feels a sense of belonging and shared purpose. We will engage with communities as our partners to help us meet common economic and social challenges, mobilizing knowledge to drive innovation, confront climate change, and address growing inequality. And we will push SFU in new directions to expand our reach and impact on our economy and on our society. I'm so excited about the possibilities that are both underway and on the horizon at SFU Surrey. The stunning new uh, Surrey campus building opened last year is home to the first of its kind sustainable engineering program that will make BC a leader in clean tech and sustainable energy solutions. Our new Quantum Algorithms Institute will anchor an innovation corridor and cement SFU's place as a global leader in quantum computing. And of course, you may have heard something about the potential for a new kind of medical school on SFU Surrey's campus, a different kind of medical school with a focus on primary care and innovation in community-based approaches. A new medical school focused on the future health care needs of British Columbians a medical school that will help strengthen public health and improve health outcomes for generations to come. We look forward to working with the Fraser Health Authority, our First Nations Health Authority and the government to pursue this vision. But for now, let me say that SFU will do everything we can to make the new medical school a reality. It is precisely this kind of project that demonstrates the power of education to transform lives and communities. No doubt, we have a lot of work ahead of us. These are incredibly challenging times, but I'm confident that together we can help steer through this pandemic and lay the foundation for a more resilient, inclusive, and indeed prosperous future. So to talk a bit about the ways that we can do that, I'm now gonna invite our special guests to join me in the conversation. Diane and Doug, I wanna thank you both so very much um, for being here today. Great to be here. That's great. So let me begin. Um, um, and I'm going to begin with you, Doug. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit uh, about your connections with Simon Fraser University. Good to be your... here. Hi, everyone. Oh, hi, Diane. So it's great to have you with us, Diane. So let's begin a conversation. And Doug, let me start with you. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your work and your interactions with SFU and how you've seen SFU help build more inclusive and healthy communities. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I wanted to start off with the, the fact that I'm actually a graduate from UBC and SFU. And one of the things that I've appreciated with SFU is um, your willingness to put uh, campuses in, in downtown cores. Uh, when I was taking my master's in education, uh, I, I was able to go to the Woodwards, SFU Woodwards, and it was, it was so lively and so connected with the community. And, and I see that that is also and has happened uh, in Surrey, the Surrey Central Campus. And aside from the physical locations of uh, the campuses and, and the one in Surrey, um, it's, it works well in tandem with the ethos and the culture that's being created there by Steve Dooley and others, where um, they understand that their job is to be a convener and a connector of community organizations uh, and business organizations. And, and my organization, Unity, has really benefited from that in a variety of ways. Uh, first of all, um, I was talking about this a little bit earlier on with Joy, um, we're part of the Community Scholar Program and that allowed us to uh, do a variety of research that was needed about housing for people with disabilities and uh, was really a big part in the next department that we're going to be building, the research that was done there about uh, people uh, with disabilities and their housing situations. Um, we also participated in uh, SFU's uh, uh, Community Ambassadors Program, which I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about later, uh, as well as the Community Leaders Igniting Change, the CLIC program, uh, both which have been instrumental in moving our organization forward. Um, but I also see the re relationship as reciprocal, and uh, we contribute to SFU. One, one way was with the uh, Center for Dialogue, the Guide for Inclusive Public Engagement was created, 
self-advocates of Samyamu um, participated in that and talked about the ways that they uh, uh, bring community together. Um, and uh, we also, Unity is a proud sponsor of SFU events. And uh, it, it's great for us because we need to be connected outside of the disability community. We need to be connected with the entire community so that the gifts uh, of people with disabilities can be, can be known. So uh, yeah, that, that's just a few ways. Uh, Thank you so much, Doug. It's so interesting. And, and I, I like your point about reciprocity, that obviously we gain so much ourselves through these partnerships and hopefully are also able to give back. And, and that is what an ideal partnership um, is all about. Um, so uh, turning from a community partner to one of our professors, um, um, Diane, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the work that you're doing and the way that you are connecting um, with community um, through your scholarship. Oh, Diane, you're on mute. Thanks. I'm honored to be here. And um, thanks to the Surrey Board of Trade. Um, I'm happy to say that you've awarded some of my students the top 25 under 25 awards. So that's great. Thank you. Um, that's one of the ways we connect. Uh, let me mention two projects I'm working on because I think they could illustrate um, how we see that kind of reciprocity. Uh, the first one is a super cluster project, and this is for the COVID-19 uh, vaccinations. Um, it's a big project with um, many partners. It's headed by Cambion um, and other health tech um, companies such as Life Labs, IBM, Well Health, Ticket Health, Providence Health, and SFU. Uh, my role on the project is a bit like um, what Doug was saying about the scholars program, where uh, it's difficult for companies who are, you know, working flat out, we're working as fast as we can to get all the logistics of uh, making the vaccinations possible for all Canadians. But it's difficult for companies to really um, delve into the kind of uh, research that's sometimes necessary. So. That's my role, which is to um, make sure that people who are vulnerable and at risk, their needs are taken into account, that they can use um, the online booking system and that the logistics work for them as well. So it might seem like, oh, it's a software project where you can book your vaccination times and get information and track any potential Adverse events, but really what's underneath that kind of under the hood is this massive logistical, technological and physical system of making sure Canadians can get um, vaccinated. And we're talking about 79,000 Canadians per day. So it's a really big complex problem or what we call in the tech domain, a wicked problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my favorite. Um, so I think it aligns really well with the, the equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I'm really excited, Joy, that, that you're spearheading that. That's awesome. Uh, the other work that I uh, more typically do is um, invent health technologies for to support people who live with chronic conditions, uh, particularly chronic pain. And that's not a symptom, but a, a disease in its own right and it affects one in five people who live in industrialized countries. So um, uh, the, the, the pain doctors I work with, uh, for example, work at JPOX um, at the outpatient building, and there's a, a specific pain clinic there. Um, and just the sheer number of people who suffer from chronic conditions and need to manage it is massive. And it really puts a lot of pressure on our national healthcare system. And so uh, I see technology as a way to expand capacity, not replace anyone or anyone's skills, but to, to expand capacity. And I think technology is changing relationships between um, patients and their healthcare providers. Uh, there's more of a partnership that technology enables. And it um, also enables us to become more aware of and in control of our own health. Um, and, and 
I think, especially the work with pain, uh, focuses on how our health isn't just about our physical condition, but our psychological and social context as well. So it's a really exciting time um, to see how technology uh, can offer things. So for chronic pain patients, immersive virtual reality, for example, um, works as a non-pharmacological analgesic or almost as um, a medication, uh, uh, analgesic, a painkiller. And that's amazing uh, that it works that way. Um, but I think part of the reciprocity and SFU's role in the community is to really make sure that none of this is snake oil, that we rigorously test it and make sure it's safe and it works for everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you know, it's so um, reassuring, I have to say, uh, Diane, first of all, around the vaccination <clears throat> process to hear all the work that's already happening on the ground. And I think we all had a sense of that, but to learn more about that is, is, is fantastic. And I think we've all been concerned about how we are accounting for particularly vulnerable groups who will be requiring the vaccine and how they'll be accessing. So that's really great to know that you're focused on that work. Um, and the, obviously the work on pain, chronic pain is um, a top of mind issue for so many Canadians um, and a great demonstration of the ways in which SFU researchers are dealing with um, pressing issues and working in partnership. So, so thanks, um, uh, two great examples of really what I am hoping to do more of at SFU um, and try to, as I said in, in my introductory remarks, strengthen this connectivity. Uh, Doug, you mentioned um, um, in your um, uh, initial remarks, um, you made some comments about um, working in particular with the SEMIAMU um, and, and thinking about how the SEMIAMU potentially could connect with SFU. Um, I'm just wondering if you, if you want to talk a little bit more and help share a little bit more about how these programs really support your, your own organization's strategic goals and, and just unpack that a little bit more for us as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and just before that, uh, an example of S SFU playing a connector role is that uh, Diane and I will be chatting afterwards about uh, 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 vaccination and, and vulnerable populations. So, you know, there it is in action right there. So Semi Amaho Society, which is uh, one of our three unity organizations, uh, supports people with developmental disabilities and acquired brain injury. Um, to be fully included in the community. And, um, and SFU is a vehicle and a partner in us uh, reaching our mission or our ends. And, and I, I took the, we, we have some pretty significant missions and ends and, and I'm just gonna list a couple of them where it fits. And then I'm gonna talk about two programs uh, that SFU Surrey runs that have been uh, really great in moving our organization forward. So, um, our ends are, some of them are, people with disabilities will perform different social roles. They will be leaders. They will have educational opportunities. They will have paid employment opportunities. Uh, they will participate in the life of the community. Um, and, and as well, that the community itself will be aware of the universal rights of all people. So um, it's really important for us that we partner with organizations that have like-minded missions and SFU very much does, not just in policy, but in the actions that are performed by the people that we meet and that we know there um, at SFU. And, and two examples uh, that, uh, of programs that SFU Surrey has run are the CTU Expo Ambassadors Program. So this was a conference where community and academia comes together and talks about those connections. And SFU did a fantastic job of actually making it half the people there being the community. Usually I think it's mostly academia. So it was a wonderful thing. Not only that, it wasn't just talking about it, it was in action as well. So they said, well, if we're gonna do this, doesn't it make sense that we would employ people from our community to be part of it? And, and so the ambassador program uh, began where they got our organization, other organizations uh, together, people that work with diverse populations of people and support diverse populations of people, brought them together and created, a, I think it was about 50 ambassadors who were trained to be uh, hosts, recorders, uh, really uh, impactful and useful uh, jobs and participants 
in in the conference and um, they were there and the and the people we support uh, with disabilities who were involved with that um, it was a great life experience for them uh, but not only that what SFU said is you know it's not a one and done it's not going to end at the end of the conference we're going to continue with it and so they continued with more uh, ambassador learning and training and uh, right now with COVID it's being put on hold a little bit but I know that when things open up again those ambassadors will have more job opportunities and and the connections that were created in there were fantastic so Craig um, uh, a guy that uh, we support a uh, great guy he would then go and, and knock on Steve Dooley's door and have chats with him and so those are connections that in the past have not been able to happen because people with disabilities were not able to overcome the barriers that the Ivor Tower had in place. And by opening that up, you collect, create connections and where people can, can, can then have networks that will support them the way that my network supported me in my life. The second program is Community Leaders Igniting Change. Dr. Kathleen Burke is a wonderful mm -hmm. professor who's uh, uh, passionate about this stuff and has uh, just done an incredible job. And, and, and this is a course where um, uh, uh, diverse people from the community uh, come together and take a course about leadership. And within that course, they develop their own leadership um, and they also sort of support each other and make uh, a connection, a network uh, with, with each other. Um, so we've been so fortunate to have seven of our employees and four people uh, with disabilities who have gone through that program. And each one of them has participated, has created uh, their own project that they bring through. So again, a way that SFU is really helping the entire community. Um, and then they come back to our organization with this knowledge and this learning and this leadership that helps our organization become much more resilient and stronger. And, and one other thing that happened from that is Krista Milne, a uh, young lady who has Down syndrome, uh, also happens to be my stepdaughter. I'll, I'll put that in there because I'm quite proud of her. She um, was able to uh, uh, present about Click at the Ashoka San Diego conference, an international conference for uh, academia, where a, a young lady with Down syndrome was able to present and talk about uh, Click, her leadership ability. So again, I find that as reciprocal because that those academics there probably had never thought that there was this potential where people with disabilities could actually teach something, and and there it was and it was happening. So uh, again, SFU and and you know what that. Um, addresses one of our strategic goals, which is that we will be internationally uh, recognized as a champion of inclusion. So when we're doing this and partnering with SFU, it really does bring us forward in a wonderful way. Well, thanks, Doug. I'm grinning ear to ear because I'm just so proud of the work that we are doing at SFU. And I think that the, the, the examples you give are just so wonderful in terms of demonstrating the power uh, of partnership and connection. I have to admit as president, I've also been thinking, and, and this has been ongoing at SFU, you know, just about the fact that we do um, have a number thousand of over a thousand faculty and staff working at the university. And there's a potential to use our infrastructure um, that we have, our, our hiring ability, our training abilities um, to support community. And um, so uh, more to come, more to think about um, in this realm. So. And we've learned through through partnerships that um, such as the ones that you've you've described. You know, Diana, you you talked a little bit about technology and using technology to work with vulnerable groups. Um, you know, I, I guess maybe a, a two part question. One is, I'm actually kind of interested in hearing a little bit more about the ways that you actually work with these different populations and how you know as a computer scientists, you go out and, and understand what those needs are, but also a little bit about how you see technology, the role of technology changing. I think particularly, well, here we all are on Zoom, so obviously the role of technology is changing all the time, but I, I'd be interested from your perspective as a professor in this area, um, what changes you're seeing in terms of engagement in particular? Sure. Um, in technology, there's, there's nothing if not constant unrelenting change. Um, usually that's great. Sometimes it's a bit overwhelming, uh, but there's always opportunities. So, so it's always exciting. Um, let me give you two examples, I think. Um, one is I, I mentioned that technology is really ch pretty rapidly changing um, 
healthcare and kind of offering a lot of opportunities. Um, and I would be remiss as a professor, uh, not to mention our courses. So I teach in the School of Interactive Arts and Technology. So imagine if you took a computer science department and married it with interaction designers and uh, media producers uh, and media analysts uh, and anthropologists. So, so we're all geeks in a sense, um, and we put people first at the center of what we do. And in health technology, um, that means we develop patient-centered approaches. And it's funny when I, I talk to doctors, they say, what do you mean? Isn't what we do already <clears throat> patient-centered? Uh, and in a sense, yes, it, it is, but the way uh, it's that approach differs from traditional approaches is we talk to patients. We include them in participatory design. So at every stage of technology development, we include them as patient partners. So we have long-term relationships with uh, many patients. And for the, um, the COVID-19 vaccination project, um, my grad students and I um, contact um, every nonprofit we can. And we talk to the people, the kind of top level organizers because they have a meta view. And then we talk to people on the ground. So for example, um, family caregivers of BC um, have um, literally thousands of, of caregivers across the province. And we're talking to um, many different kinds. So we try to come up with an idea of the different kinds of needs. Some are very visible, such as chronic conditions, um, aging, um, compromised immune systems, and some are not so visible. So for example, um, vulnerable and at risk also means the frontline healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. And um, we're uncovering other um, kinds of groups. For example, if um, a daughter or son is, is taking care of um, an aging mom or dad, and their mom or dad really depend on them for medication and, and daily support and um, food and uh, going to the doctor. If they come down with COVID, if they're not vaccinated first, who takes care of mom and dad? So there's, we, we go out into the community and really talk to as many people as we can. And I think it's important that the kind of graduate students uh, we're blessed with at Surrey are um, many are international. And so we have um, Mandarin speakers. Um, some of my team are from uh, North India, some from South India. And that means that we have kind of a deeper understanding of um, what it would be like for an extended family to schedule vaccinations. Sounds like a simple task. Uh, it turns out not to be so easy. Um, so, so those are some of the ways. Um, also the courses we teach, um, we put again, patients first or know thy user is one of our most important ideas and approaches. And so students actually go out and talk to patients, talk to nonprofits, um, go to Surrey Memorial Hospital and uh, work on problems that people in the community have instead of us inflicting some abstract academic problem. Uh, so we're really hands-on. And I have to say the results are amazing. Um, in addition to awards, um, some of our students, for example, um, are heading initiatives at Children's Hospital um, for the kind of uh, tech support that kids who are undergoing chemotherapy need there. Um, one of the students in my classes just got into medical school. Um, his name is Prob, and I'm really um, just thrilled about that. Um, but really our students, they start with internships while they're at SFU. Uh, they work with the community during their coursework and most have jobs before they graduate, which is really great. Uh, and they remain in connection with us and that helps us connect, kind of develop deeper connections with the community. 
Um, and finally, um, one of the things I bring to SFU is I worked in industry for about a day before it became one of the, the frightful five <laughs> when we were still just an upstart. And what was important about that is um, this was during a time where computers were thought to be only used by experts in businesses. Um, and no one really took it seriously that regular people would want to use computers. So ease of use and was, was one of the biggest things I learned at Apple, that computers for the rest of us is an idea that has to underlie the kind of tech development we do. And in, in a weird twist of fate, um, in order to kind of uh, increase the impact of not only my work, but the work of my students, I just um, formed my own startup. So I'm part of the 2.5% of uh, tech startups that are headed by women, yay. Uh, and so I'm employing a few students and, and hope to employ more. <laughs> That's fantastic. You know, it's interesting. Um, uh, I, I love those examples, Diane, because um, not only are you demonstrating the connection with the community solving problems, uh, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of also preparing um, our students to go out into the workforce, make a difference, and also the ways that our own professors are developing um, um, innovations um, that make a difference in developing companies, spinning out companies. So these are win. These are kind of triple bottom line wins for us, and I'm I'm really really pleased that you were able um, um, to highlight them. I know there's some questions coming up in the chat, so I'm going to just ask a final question over to you, Doug. And and that question is simple, and that's basically. If, uh, if you could ask SFU to do something more for you, um, you know, or partner in a new way, what would you ask of us? Yeah, so I, I think to uh, continue to be the, uh, the, the connector that you are, um, social services and business, and my role as the chair of the Surrey Board of Trade is I think a validation of the idea that you need to have both of those groups working together. They support each other. They're not opposites, they're actually combined. And now I think uh, if we add uh, you know, academia to that, then you have a, a trifecta that's really gonna be a, a winner. And, and I know SFU has been doing wonderful work uh, with the business uh, sector in, in Surrey as well. Um, I do think though that for people that um, perhaps haven't had the exposure or historically been allowed to be part of university life, there could be ways, more ways that SFU could um, embrace uh, the inclusion of all people on their campuses. And it might not necessarily be within a, a course, uh, although there are some great organizations such as Steps Forward that support universities to have people with developmental disabilities take part in the classes. But if you think about all our lives and how we've uh, been successful and connected, a lot of it has been through the friends and contacts we've made in the university setting. And if you have a large number of people because of their personal circumstances who are never engaged with that, they're never allowed to do that. And so figure out a way to engage, and yes, if he's already doing this very well, but more ways to engage the community, have them part of the campus uh, so that they can have those sort of extracurricular connections that are gonna help them move their lives forward. And as well, in a reciprocal way, benefit uh, the professors and the students who now see that there's more to life than just what's within their lab and their classroom. Mm -hmm. So that would be great. Thank you very much. That's great input. And I'm going to invite Anita into the conversation. Uh, Anita, I, I, I would love to know, uh, ask you as well, um, uh, as we start to move into the chat, maybe you could um, uh, give me some advice about how SFU can continue to support the growing business community here in Surrey. Well, Joy, I think uh, there's certainly a significant revitalized opportunity for SFU uh, to have a complete intrinsic presence, not only in the downtown core, but in all of Surrey and in the South Fraser economic region. We have another 1.3 million people moving into the Metro Vancouver region by 2050, and many of them will live, learn, work, and play 
in Surrey and in the South Fraser region. So there's three components really that the university needs to focus on from an economic development foundation. And that's around number one, innovation. Uh, focused on prosperity projects, university-based economic development, and ensuring that everyone knows about that, communicating it out. Number two is about talent, upskilling, reskilling. Our workforce strategy that we released at the Surrey Board of Trade last year is all about ensuring that we're engaging more with industry partners and education, especially in light of the changes presented by the pandemic. And number three, the university is such a significant opportunity around place. And it's not only placemaking, it's about ensuring that the university in all of Surrey is a place for arts, events, people, and heart. Uh, we really need to ensure that we bring the heart back into Surrey. And uh, I, for example, being an SFU alumni, believe that SFU has the potential to do that for our city. Well, that's absolutely inspiring. And you can count on us. Absolutely. Um, I think even the two examples we've shared today, and I want to thank Doug and I want to thank Diane for joining me. I, I thought it was really uh, more than me talking about this to have partners come and talk about the work they're doing would be such a better example uh, of the way we work, but look forward to um, moving forward with this. So I'm going to pass it back to you, Anita. Um, it's been great um, to be part of this conversation, and I, I assume we might have some questions. Absolutely, Joy. My first question to you is, as we mentioned and discussed earlier, is around vaccine development and distribution. Of course, it's been in the news with the Prime Minister uh, even this morning. But tell me your perspective about uh, your the, the research by Simon Fraser University into seniors care. Um, is SFU participating in research for COVID-19 vaccine? And with the medical school uh, coming up, what's the role in terms of uh, vaccine development and research? This is not going to be the last pandemic that we face. Yeah, thank you very much for that. So let me just say a few things about this. First, I'm so proud of our researchers at Simon Fraser University, Diane amongst them doing work um, that really is on the front line of some of what she recalled, referred to as wicked problems related to COVID-19. Um, and and um, certainly um, at SFU on our Burnaby campus, we have received funds to actually refit a lab so that we can deal with the virus because um, we are developing new testing uh, mechanisms. Um, researchers are focused on that, but they're also focused on the social implications. We've got researchers in our Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences looking at gender differences, for example, and the ways in which um, the virus is affecting different communities in different ways. Um, we keep hearing about the she session, um, and I think you know, really under, understanding the way it is affecting people's work life and home life um, um, is important. The other exciting development for us, uh, Anita, um, is that um, the, the, the government of British Columbia um, has given some funds to Simon Fraser Universities to establish a pandemic studies center. And um, we're just getting going on this. It's very exciting. It's new news for us. Um, but uh, we recognize that we have a lot of expertise in the area, particularly in the area of modeling. Um, we've got mathematicians, computer scientists working on modeling um, the ways in which um, the pandemic spreads. And indeed, um, some of our researchers are providing um, all the up-to-date information, not only to here in British Columbia, but to um, um, our, uh, the federal government as well and the Public Health Agency of Canada. So we've got a lot of expertise um, and um, trying to center that and then figure out ways um, that um, this new Pandemic Studies Center will be able to work collaboratively with the BC Center for Disease Control. So um, exciting developments, early days, and look forward to, because as you said, we can learn now. Um, so should something like this happen again, we'll be prepared. Um, this, we, have to, um, we have to learn um, from these current dynamics. Absolutely. Tell me your perspective, Joy, about uh, advocacy to the BC government. Uh, we have a new premier and cabinet. Uh, one of our advocacy pieces that has been ongoing at the Surrey Board of Trade is to advocate for more seat spaces uh, for the university. 
And in alignment with that is, of course, housing and transportation. What do you think the priorities will be now uh, for the BC government in light of financial challenges and then their investments in education? Yeah, um, so early days, obviously, um, just heard about the cabinet being announced yesterday, and um, we've busy, busily looking at uh, mandate letters at the present time. But we were very heartened to see uh, in the NDP platform um, a commitment to 2000 more tech seats in the post secondary system uh, in um, British Columbia. And obviously, we'd like to see a number of those seats coming to Simon Fraser University, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, and so we're busy thinking about what the opportunity is going to be. Um, I'll, we'll be putting our hands up. Um, obviously, we are seeking meetings quickly with our new Minister of Advanced Education, but also with our Minister of Health because of the potential um, for the development of a new medical program as well, which, it, it, as I already mentioned, is very exciting. One of our, our newer members is um, in robotics. Mm -hmm. And I had a chance to speak to him yesterday, uh, but uh, I'm interested as we move forward uh, with, uh, you know, the, the advent of new technology, which is ever changing. What is uh, SFU's role and vision as it relates to artificial intelligence research and also innovation? Well, you know, um, th those are two um, huge areas and areas that SFU has a lot of expertise in. As I mentioned, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, I had the privilege to uh, help kick off a big data strategy for Simon Fraser University. And obviously part of big data is really feeding artificial intelligence and helping um, us really um, make, uh, make decisions in particularly complex, in, in particular complex dynamics. Um, in, in relation to robotics as well, um, you know, mechatronic systems engineering um, program, um, there are a number of researchers there very, very interested in robotics and their application, particularly in industry. Um, and, you know, I would say that's part of what SFU is, is, is looking for ways in which our research can have application in the real world and the way to do that. And that's what this panel's all been about is to understand what the issues of industry are so that we can come together and, and partner. Um, and, and those partnerships are so important to us because not only do we learn a lot from our partners, hopefully we contribute to those solutions. Uh, so um, I do think the other thing I would say with the quantum algorithms, I mean, it sounds, you know, I, for me, I'm not a quantum computing uh, expert, um, but the applications in quantum algorithms will have implications for artificial intelligence and, um, and have opportunities to really, again, sort through some of the really complex issues um, that we're facing in society. So really have a lot of hope for the outcomes and, and a lot of industry are really interested in those applications. So look forward to seeing what comes um, as that, um, as the Quantum Algorithm Institute gets up and running as well. Joy, we've really been promoting the Health and Technology District uh, and, and not only related to health technology, but so many different types of technology uh, just across uh, from Surrey Hospital. And SFU is a part of that district, and we're so excited about the new medical school. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the timeline, if you know it? Will you be engaging in community stakeholder consultation because the nature of primary care has really transformed as well? And uh, what's the future? Yeah, so again, early days um, and um, just starting to have the conversations about how to move this forward. But let me say I was really inspired um, by the founding dean of the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. He was talking to me about how they that's the most recent medical program established in Canada. And he was talking to me about how they very much a community um, engaged medical program started out and they started out with community consultation hearing from the community what they need from their medical practitioners. And uh, you know, I, I think just reflecting back also on Diane's um, comment, you know, to have you know, human-centered design for our medical program as well, I think would be really incredible. Um, obviously, you know, for certification um, purposes, there are requirements and we'll have to attend to all of that. 
Um, but I do think there's an opportunity in the SFU way to engage our communities, to hear from vulnerable groups, and to really think about the design of a program that could be a game changer. And that's what excites me um, about the potential of a program like this. Um, so again, early days and, um, you know, development of a curriculum like this takes time. And then obviously there's certification issues, et cetera. You can't offer a program um, without the colleges uh, approving these programs, obviously. So it's going to take us a while, um, but I have every confidence that we'll be able to put a team together um, to really um, achieve an, an incredible program. The other thing I would say um, um, for my SFU colleagues listening is that obviously we have to engage the SFU community as well. These programs also get approved by our Senate and Board of Governors. And so we also have to go engage in those internal processes, but exciting times for sure. Joy, I'm going to leave it there in terms of questions. And for the audience, uh, for those questions that were unanswered, we will get back to you after the session is over. Uh, but Joy, I just wanted to ask you if you have any final remarks about Surrey's economic recovery and economic development moving into the future. Well, you know, um, I, I just feel very optimistic, actually, Anita, and I was so heartened by your introductory remarks because it reminded me that um, Surrey does understand the role that post-secondary education and particularly Simon Fraser University plays in economic recovery. We are part of the community. We stand ready um, to work with you. Um, and so um, I know there'll be tough sledding ahead for all of us but I really look forward to the opportunities to continue to work with the Surrey Board of Trade, its members uh, and the entire community. Um, we are, as I said in my remarks, uh, you, know, we, you, know, you are SFU and, um, and, and we know that and we look forward to building on that. Thank you so much, Joy, for your remarks. And we look forward to working with you to make Surrey an opportunity city. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us in this one hour that we had with you. Thank you to our presenting sponsors, Central City at Blackwood Partners, our community partners at Downtown Surrey BIA, the Health and Technology District at the Lark Group, and the Surrey City Development Corporation, and of course, our ongoing media partner, the Surrey Now Leader. Thank you so much for being with us. Check out all of our programs and services at Business and Surrey.com. Don't miss our Surrey Art and Business Awards on December 3rd at four o'clock, where we're featuring the Mayor of Kelowna. Thank you so much for being with us. Make it a great business day.